Okay, as we continue in worship this morning, will you please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll look at verses 18 through 23. We'll finish up the chapter, Lord willing. And everyone said, Amen. okay, I'll take that. And if you were here with us last week, we, we talked about, you know, Paul was, was encouraging the, the church um, with some warnings, you could say, right? And he's saying, look, there's only one foundation in which you can build a church. If you're not building on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, you're not building a church, right? We could, we could boil it down to that statement. I believe that's a true statement, right? If you're not building upon Christ, you're building something else, right? It might be a, a shelter of sorts, but it's not going to be the church. And so he uses this, this metaphor. You know, he's talked about the Corinthians as he's planted and watered, and he switches gears from the field to construction. And he says, the, 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 the church is a building. You are God's building. And he tells the leaders, you've got to be careful how you build on this foundation. The foundation is sure, right? Nothing's going to crack the foundation. That's not your problem, right? The problem is how you build upon it. And so I mentioned last week that all that glitters is not gold, right? We can build, and, and, and in our view of things, we may say this looks good and this is right, but if it, it's not being built, right, with the truths of God's Word, no matter how good it looks, we know at the end, Paul tells us, the, the church that's built with precious stones, they get refined. And those built with wood and hay gets burned, right? There's a refinement. And he ends that passage, which is verse 17, with a warning. It says, anyone who defies the temple, or excuse me, defi uh, defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It's speaking of the church as a whole, when, God's, when the church assembles in the name of Jesus Christ, God's presence is here. Of course it is. It's his church. It's his embassy from heaven on earth. Paul is going to continue in this idea that that really all that glitters is not gold, right? He's going to continue in this mindset. He's going to say, hey, you got to be careful. And if this is the church you want to have, if you want to be building with precious stones, well, then uh, as he continues on, what I've simply called today is the church is, is a determined church, right? The determined church. I'm really creative in my, my titles. I don't know why you're laughing at that. No, no, it is, right? Not creative. Straightforward, right? You have to be. There's some things that you have to be determined in in your own life. The church has to be determined in, right? Sanctification by God's word. His word is truth. We have to maintain certain things. We have to be aware and not naive of the things that try to infiltrate, things that come in, because we can, right? Paul says you can build on this foundation with mud and stone. That stuff sticks, right? Dick, uh, duct tape and, and Gorilla Glue, those things work for a while, right? It sticks. It sticks on the foundation, but we know at the end it gets consumed. And so not everything that glitters is gold. Not everything is as it is. And Paul goes on and says, don't be deceived. Right? In the very beginning, the passage we'll read here in a moment, he says, don't you be deceived. Right? Don't deceive yourself. And it's a command. And you think that doesn't have to be commanded. Right? You, you would think we don't have to tell you don't deceive yourself. That should be automatic. Of course I don't want to be deceived. But we know that, it, that the enemy is crafty. We know that sin blinds us and we can be deceived. It gives this command, don't do this. Right? It may look right. It may feel right. But if it's not according to God's word, do not do it. Don't deceive yourself. There's a story of a pastor who was doing some visitation. And he went to uh, a lady. who was an older lady in, her con in his congregation. And he came and he visited. And she was home. And so he, he came in and he sat down. And he noticed as they were conversing in the living room that on the coffee table was a bowl of peanuts. And so he politely asked, could I have some of these peanuts? Oh, sure, she said. As the conversation went on, he realized, and it was kind of wrapping up, he had eaten most of the peanuts. Feeling kind of a little bit embarrassed, he, he told her, I'm sorry, I, I, I ate most of your peanuts. The lady's response, well, that's okay. Ever since I lost my teeth, I've only been able to suck the chocolate off them anyway. Because those peanuts are there and the peanuts look good doesn't mean we should be eating them, does it? <laughs> Paul's going to come and he says, don't, don't deceive yourself. Some things in church life are going to look good. Some things in your own life are going to look good. And he's going to say, don't 
don't deceive yourself. You have to be determined unto yourself. Right? The church that's going to build on this foundation with precious stones. It's going to build with, with gold and silver. Church is going to be this. Church is going to do this with the Great Commission as their forefront, with their fix upon it. This church is going to be led by the Word of God. That's what he's saying. He's speaking to the leaders, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. So here's the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 18 through 23. He says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Paul's conclusion, therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Let me pray. Father, once again, we come to you, and we, Lord, in humility and in reverence, we ask, God, that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that you would open our eyes to your truth and teach us, Lord, from your word. Let us grab hold of this. Let us be um, dedicated and fervent, Lord, in our walk and our pursuit after you, that you would be glorified and that you would be at work in the good work you've begun and refining us. And I ask, Lord, as always, take me out of the way that every thought and life fixed upon you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned last week, this is the, the building of the church is this ongoing process. Of course, throughout history, there are many who are going to come and build upon it. Many are going to retire. Many are going to go on in glory. And there'll be others who will come in their place. The church is an ongoing process. Paul is saying, look, well, God has blessed my planting. He has blessed Apollos' watering, right? You've got the, the planter and the irrigator. They're both working. God has blessed both of them. The church is an ongoing process. But he says if you, when this is ongoing and God's at work, he brings increase. It must be done with care. It must be done with accountability. And it must be done with caution. We just can't go willy-nilly, right? I don't know if that's a technical term right there, but you just can't go do it any way you want. That's what he's saying. You have to be careful. And you have to be almost you know, doubly, if that's a word, careful, because we can, some of these things that aren't in line with Scripture can be brought into the church. They can be looked good, right? They, they, they look like this is the way it should be. And he says, no, this is wood and straw, and this stuff will be burned. You're building on the right foundation, but you're building something that won't endure, definitely through eternity. So Paul ends that passage last, last week with a warning, but he begins this one with a command. In verse 18, he has this command, do not Deceive yourself. It's an imperative verb. Do not do this. And you again, you would think no one would have to explain that to you, right? Because I don't know of anyone who wants to actively be deceived. But we can be. And especially leaders within the church. So he begins with a warning. The, the ending of that verse going into this one, we see the, the, the imperative, the command, and we have this idea the church is at a crossroads. We know, Paul, you've told us how to build a church we got to do it this way. The leaders have got to be true to God's word. It doesn't mean we're, we're perfect. There's, we're, no one is. We're saints and sinners, but we keep pressing in to God's word. We continue to submit ourselves to his authority. So how do we go about that? If we're going to see activity, right? We want, God is, is saying, and Paul has been telling us, there is activity on, on Paul's part. There's activity on Apollos' part. But God is the fulfillment. God is the one who fulfills. He brings the increase. And I believe a church that is determined, determined to, to build upon, your life to build upon God's word, you have to realize that there is an activity on your part. And we trust the Lord to fulfill it. We trust him to guide us by his Holy Spirit. And going into this, I just simply said, looking at this as, as the church, as you being a member of the church, this speaks to each and every one of us. And my first point simply is this. We must be determined to evaluate ourselves. We must be determined to evaluate ourselves. And why is that? Because here is the command, right? Let no one deceive himself. 
We can be deceived and we better be aware of it. He says, if anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. That seems completely upside down, doesn't it? But here Paul confronts the problem, the danger of self-delusion. That's what he's saying. Look, you have some folks in your church, Corinthians, who are not teaching the Word of God. They're creating division. They're not ending division. They're spurring it on. This is the ongoing battle with the flesh. This feels right. This is what we should be doing. But he says this is the word, right? To deceive, which simply means to cause someone, or in this case, the Corinthians themselves, this today would be us, to cause ourselves to have misleading views concerning the truth. Now this happens, and I'm sure you probably are aware of this, but there's a tendency, I'll just put it like that, that we would, we would live by our own convictions. We set our own standards, right? At the end of the day, if I've met my standard, I'm, I'm pretty good. There's a story one time of a pastor who was uh, accused of some things that, that he was being released from his position over. And his response to it is he never, he never compromised his conviction. Well, his conviction didn't line up with the Scriptures, right? And that was the problem. And we can do this in our own lives, right? We can say, well, this is my standard. These are my own resolution. If I meet that standard, I'm okay. And Paul's saying, don't. this is a, a, a way in which we can deceive ourselves if your standard is not the Bible. So Paul says, hey, let no one deceive himself. You don't think that your philosophies, your values, you know, don't think they're, they're going to they're gonna build you up. No, this is the stuff that gets destroyed, right? It's going to be detrimental to you. It's going to be detrimental if you bring that as a leader into the church or if you try to propagate it in the church. Do not do this. You're actually deceiving yourself. And there's a tendency here where you just simply say, don't kid yourself. You're leaving the gospel behind. Right? We're leaving the gospel. And so Paul says, hey, true wisdom is to side with God. God uh, re- reverses, if you will, right? It's the great reversal. This is how God approaches this. And Paul has been telling us this all the way in chapter 1. He's been talking about the foolishness of, of Jesus. He's been talking about the foolishness of the cross. He's been telling us, hey, there's these, the Greeks think this whole thing is a big joke. They can't understand a God who actually has emotion, let alone die in this way and have emotion for others. The Jews who think, hey, man, there's this, this Jesus. He can't die on a cross because we know. We're smarter than God here, and we know that anyone who hangs on a, cur- on, a, on a cross is accursed. But Paul says this, he tells the church, if anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool. And here's our problem, right? We think ourselves wise. I'm not talking about intelligence, but we think ourselves wise. I don't know if you've ever used this sentence in, re- in referring to yourself or to someone else, but I'm a pretty sharp cookie. Has anyone ever, you ever said that? Yeah, but the cookie can't cut the cake, right? And does that work together? Is that even possible? I don't know. Right? But the Christian, and Paul's point here, is to come to this great reversal and realize that if we think we are wise, especially in the world's eyes, then we must become a fool. And to become a fool, what Paul has been saying, is to embrace the truths Christ. Embrace his word. The world is already saying he is a fool. And this has been Paul's message from the beginning. Chapter 1, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is God's power manifested in weakness. But we preach Christ, him crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. Chapter 1, verse 23, can you imagine if, if the Corinthians and the church today was preoccupied with this? Coming to and saying, look, I realize I can be deceived. Paul puts this in imperative mood, meaning that we can deceive ourselves. We can create our own standard. We can say, well, I'm pretty good. Or at least we could say, I'm not as bad as that guy. All right? Some of us, we've done that. And Paul's saying, when you do this, you're deceiving yourself. Come bring your life. Compare it to Scripture. And too often we think, well, I don't want to do that because it exposes too much. Well, that's the good. That's the gold. That's the stuff that's refined. Those are the good things that grow in our life. Can you imagine if we were preoccupied with this thought? 
instead of trying to be wise in this world, but to come and say, you know what? The world has nothing for me. I'd rather become a fool, clinging to the cross of Christ. Let him be my Savior. Let the world say what it wants to say. It's done it before. It'll do it again. But I want to be marked with Jesus. A church that wants to be built upon this solid foundation with precious stones is a church that's going to be called foolish. That's what he's saying. By the world. The cross is the great reversal. Jesus said something very similar. He said, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is a great reversal. Matthew 10.39. and Mark 10.31, he says, But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So why is this such a struggle? The answer for the Corinthians, the answer for us today is pride. See, in their society, to, to come out and say, this is who it is, especially with the Greeks and those of the noble of society who are saying this whole thing is foolishness. For them to come out and say, you know what, I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe, I actually believe this Jesus died upon a cross. He paid for my sins. And, the, and those in the society would say, you're one foolish cookie, right? You're a foolish joke. It's going to cost you. And the Greeks knew this, right? The Corinthians knew this. It's going to cost them social status. That was something that they had to work through. You and I are going to have to work through the same thing. It's ever growing. The attack upon Christianity will ever be growing. The pressure is always going to be there. The Bible never gives us. Where I just thought of this other sentence, that just now dawned on me. I did a few of these in here. You know, the, the sentence "I want my cake and eat it too." I think I'm craving desserts. <laughs> well, dawned on me. You know, the sentence, I want my cake and eat it too, right? We know that sentence. The Bible never gives you that option. So we want Christianity. We like the feel of this. We like these things. I got my, my get out of jail card and, I, and I've got my get out of hell card or whatever you want to call it. But yet I'm going to set my own standard, my own way. I'm going to live my own way. Because you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about love. He loves me. It's all good. Now, Paul would say, if you know Christ as your Savior, absolutely. He loves you and, and absolutely you are saved. He doesn't give you salvation in which you can live any way you want. And he says you can be actively deceived. Your leaders can be actively deceived. You must come and be determined to say, well, if I can be deceived, what are some corrections I need to make? So in my, in my notes here, I don't know if I put it in your notes or not, but I just simply said a few things we need to do is to stop lying to ourselves. At some point in your journey, if you're determined to say, you know what, I'm going to be a true follower of Christ, well, then if I know that I can be deceived, well, then stop lying to yourself. That may sound harsh, but I kind of marvel at the idea that, that Paul had to write this in a command, in an imperative mood. Let no one deceive himself. Stop lying to yourself. Stop denying ungodliness and pursue it. Second thing I see is we must stop comparing ourselves to others. This is where social media plays a big part. At least I'm not like that person. I'm not as bad as that person. We used to have a joke at Bible college about a fellow student named Gabe and we did this with anyone of course, but we still always say, Look, Gabe, if you die before me and I find out you're in heaven, I'm going to claim you. Lord, you got to let me in because you let Gabe in, right? That was our joke. It was our Achilles heel. If you get in there before me, I'm going to say you let Tyson in, all right? Fair enough, as long as I'm in there. It doesn't work that way. Each and every one of us has to know Christ. And we have this tendency to compare ourselves. We look at social media and go, well, man, I'm doing this or not doing that. We have to simply stop comparing. You have to be determined to go, you know, who am I in Jesus? How important is Christ's word to me? And the last thing here is simply start applying the Bible to our lives. This is not meant to discourage ever anyone of Right? Sometimes we come and we do these hard things. We go, oh man, this is tough. But it's good for you. Sometimes acknowledging sin is the first step. You know what? I've been in denial. I've been deceived. I've been, dece I've been craving the world. Attention, I've been following the world. And Paul is calling the leaders. He's calling this church saying, look, if you're wise in the world's eyes, you're most likely not wise in God's eyes. Whose eyes do you want to be wise in? What is the standard you're actually seeking after? Follow, right, Jesus. Grab hold of that cross. Deny yourself. Follow him. Follow him. Start applying the Bible to your life. This is where the gold and the precious stones are built. They are refined by the fire. 
They're not burnt. As Paul is, is dealing with this, he goes on to expand this idea, right, a little bit of saying, look, you have to be determined. If you're in a church that's going to grow on the, on the solid foundation, right, and be a light in a dark community, you have to be willing. You've got to be determined to be willing to challenge yourself, right, look upon yourself, assess yourself. But he goes on and says, not only is it just you, right, because all of us feel that. Hopefully this morning, every single one of us is going, oh, yeah, I need to work on that. Guess what, your pastor, I need to work on that. But the second thing, he expands this in verses 19 through 20, which simply says we must be determined as a church body to challenge world influence. He says in these verses, for the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. Straight and fair, we get it. He says, for it is written, he's referencing the Old Testament, a consistent thought through the Bible, for he, speaking of God, catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Right? We're not going to fool the Lord on anything. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. And we live in a world today, and the world thinks it's wise. They speak with authority. Right? We know better. You Christians, man, if we just had you guys gone, Everything would be better. Such profound wisdom. I don't think that statement shocks anyone, right? The world thinks it's wise. Yet here God judges the wisdom of the world in foolishness. So what are some contrasts? What are some things that help us see? What is the world actually saying that we would say, hey, what does the Bible say opposite to? The first one I have down here is the world loves power and prestige. Loves power and prestige, right? But the contrast, God displays himself in complete weakness. His son, our savior, died upon that cursed tree. And yet that moment in history overcomes all of the world's strength. Lots of reversal, isn't it? The world loves power and prestige, but God has demonstrated in the cross simple weakness. And yet, it's the power to overcome. The world longs after strong leaders. Strong leaders, nothing wrong with that, but it longs for it, right? The contrast, what Paul has been telling us throughout this is whether you plant in the church, whether you teach in the church, you're watering or irrigating, you're opening your Bible and sharing in devotion and discipleship, you're pressing on and encouraging one another. He says all of it, and he's going to tell us in this passage, is yours. All of it's the same. God has blessed the planter. He's blessed the one who waters. Right? And he goes on and Paul says they are nothing. Chapter 3, verse 7, So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters. Paul tells of the, or excuse me, Peter speaks of the, the elder. Right? His attitude of servanthood coming under. Jesus speaks of his disciples. You've heard it of, the, of those who lord, the Pharisees who lord it over the people, not with you. It's contrast to the world. The world parades its heroes and its gurus the latest fad and the gurus I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of maybe oprah winfrey and dr phil maybe i don't know but they have this look what the new thing the new teaching whatever it might be that's floating around and yet christians remember that god loves to choose the weak and the lowly the despised the nobodies and if we are to glory we're to glory in him and him alone the world tries to impress with its sophistication, of course, its form over content. And the Christian is to prize, above all, the gospel and quietly refuse anything that would take away from it. Paul says, here is the world. You have to be on guard against the influence of the world. And to make his point even more dramatic, if you will, he cites uh, Job 5.13 he, where he says he catches the wise in their own craftiness. Paul, is in essence, is saying God is able to frustrate, right, the wisdom of the wise of this world. And if you think about if you know anything about the story of Job, he had his advisors, didn't he? But they weren't very helpful. They came and they told him what to do. It was misled wisdom. And Paul saying this is what God thinks of. The wisdom of this world. He also cites Psalm 94:11. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. It's interesting if you go to Psalms 94, verse 11, the word there for wise is man. And here Paul just simply lumps them all together. 
the teachers, the leaders, everyone who thinks of themselves this way, they are in fact futile. So we see that God frustrates the plans of the wise, but he blesses those who follow after, who cooperate with God. And there's great benefits to those who who know God, who follow after him, who are aware of the influence of the world and say, I'd rather have the gospel and be counted among God's children and be counted among the world. And so for us today, if, if we're in this world and we're not of it, what are some of the things in which the world is saying? And the first thing that jumps out to my mind is we have to stop following the status quo. The world says, if it feels good, it is good. If this is for you know, the ends justify the means, if we can bring more people into the church by just compromising and not using words such as sin or repentance, but it gets more people here, are we really doing anybody any good? No, because we need to hear the words, this is sin. And yet there is a Savior, right? There is one who can redeem us. We have to stop following the status quo. James says it, I think, a little bit more harshly. He says, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, James 4.4. Simply because everyone's doing it doesn't make it right. So we have to kick in our minds. We have to think. The world is saying it's good doesn't mean it's necessarily good. It's because there's peanuts on the coffee table. Maybe you should think twice about eating them. Second thing I see is stop justifying the world system. This is the me-centered approach. The me-centered approach. Right? We do this in our study when we think, you know, what verses do I like that speak to me? And there's nothing wrong with, with having favorite verses. And what I'm getting at is ignoring the ones we don't like. We need to read the Bible through, beginning to end. We need to, to preach through all those scriptures so it forces us to, to come across those passages that might be difficult, but we need to hear them. Better the rebuke, right, of a friend than kisses from an enemy. Better that we would come and say, let's say the hard things in a way that is with love and encouraging. Let's focus on the Bible and come under it. Stop justifying it. Stop saying it's not about me. This is about Christ. How do I follow after him? And then the last thing here I say is just start focusing on God's kingdom. Jesus says in Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things. Talking about worrying, all these things of life. God will add them, but seek first. Make a decision today to say what, you know, change the question, if you will, from what do I want to what does God want of me? What does God want of me? Does he want my Monday and my Tuesday? Does he want my next breath? Are all these things for me? But there's a change. There has to be a change in a church that is determined to say, we're going to build on this awesome foundation. Jesus Christ and crucified. It's going to take some hard work, isn't it? It's tough building these things, aren't it? Aren't it? In Oklahoma, I think that's legal. (laughs) Maybe. It is. It's going to be tough. Right? But the there's good that comes from this. Precious stones that are refined in the fire. Right? Where we mirror our Savior. Where we disappear, but Jesus shines in us. And it takes us stop to do something and start to do something different. There has to be a change in our lives. We have to be aware we can deceive ourselves. And the world is watching. I've shared this story before about Hudson Taylor, the, the missionary to China, and there's there's this biographer that was commissioned by the uh, the Chinese government to follow him and to write a story about his life, but they wanted to taint him and misrepresent him. And so this person followed Hudson Taylor around for many days and to, to do his research. And he became just increasingly impressed with his character, his life. And he found it extremely difficult to carry out his, his assigned tasks with clear conscience. So eventually, the risk of losing his own life, he laid down his pen, he renounced his atheism, and trusted in Christ as Savior. See, it matters your purity. It matters your walk. It matters that you are determined to say, you know what? There is conviction, biblical conviction that needs to be in my life that says this is wrong. I'm going to call it that. We don't like doing that, but that makes us right wise unto God and a fool to the world. And this is what Paul is saying. Do not be deceived. 
God will mock all of this. God is greater. His Son has overcome this world that you live in. Don't allow its influence to come. Be determined to keep at bay the influence of the world. Jesus prayed for his own disciples. He didn't pray in his priestly prayer in John 17 to say, Lord, take them out. He says, no, they are here. I don't ask that you would take them out of the world, but I do ask that you would deliver them from the evil one. Well, be aware you have an evil one who seeks to lie to you, to deceive you, to tie you down, to make you and form you into something the world would want. Be aware of that. Do not be deceived. Do not be led away. Be determined to challenge these. And Paul's conclusion to this passage here is simply, it's rooted in Christ, right? If we're a church that's going to be determined to, to, to evaluate ourselves, to challenge the world's influence, and then verses 21 through 23 is, be determined, please church, be determined to trust Christ alone. He says, therefore, let no one boast in men. Speaking to the leaders, right? Don't boast in these men. Therefore, because why? For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God, right? You almost see the, the crescendo of this. He just exclamation points the whole thing, right? Why should we be determined in fighting our flesh and not being deceived? Why should we be on guard against the world? Because you're in Christ. You're in Christ. We have Jesus, and He's greater than all of this. So Paul is simply saying, stop boasting in, in the, the leader. Stop creating these divisions that's happening in the Corinthian church. Stop doing this because they're all in Christ. You have them all. And our boasting is to be glorifying, right, in Christ and Him alone. This is Paul's ongoing point where all things, all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, the world, life, death, present, future, things to come, they're all yours. So the question we have this morning, if, if Paul and Apollos and Cephas, they belong to the church and they contribute to the church, what does he mean with everything else? This goes beyond people, doesn't it? It's not just our leaders anymore. Paul has like, almost like departed the idea, yeah, you have the leaders. They're all the same. God blesses each and every one of them. They're all yours, and they're teaching because they have the same focus, the same goal, and that's to build a good church, a right church upon God's Word. But he says, and everything else is yours. I don't know about you, but I come across these passages of Scripture, and I go, what does that mean? What does it mean all these other things are ours? So he lists five things. The first one is world. Whether the world, and we know the world tries to squeeze you into its mold, tries to tie you down and say, this is right, that is wrong. They're going to tell you because the world is wise in its own eyes. Definitely does not encourage you to soar, right, with the redeemed. He mentions life. Isn't it interesting that we have life, and I'm sure you feel this. Sometimes we cherish life so much that we forget that the Bible says life is but a vapor. Compared to eternity, why do we invest so much time, right, upon this? Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Don't worry about them. But rather fear Him, meaning God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Right? Be determined. Know Christ. Be determined to challenge yourself. Be determined to keep the world out. He goes on, right? And in this life, there is, of course, death, the ultimate threat. Death is escaped by nobody, and it looms on the horizon for everyone, doesn't it? It could be tomorrow. Our souls could be required of us. Make sure you know Christ. You think for a moment how the goals of your life would be, ch be changed. If you plan not just for this life, but for eternity, how would that affect your outreach? How would it affect your discipleship? Paul says all this is yours. And of course, the death, it speaks to the present moment. The present moment touches on the future and all these things. I think what Paul is saying, they can divert you away. Your eyes can be taken. We can focus on this and forget that we're focusing and we have Christ. Paul says something very interesting at the end of this, doesn't he? The very last 
verses here. He says, you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Therefore, we are God's. Not God in the sense we are God. We belong to him. We belong to this God. And who is God? He is the sovereign one over all of creation. He is the one who has spoken and put everything into motion. He was the son before he decided to create the son, right? He's God. He's mighty. He's awesome. He has sent his son, not out of necessity, but but because he is love. He sends it to die a horrific death on the cross. And his savior, right? Our savior, his son, overcomes this world. This is who this God is. The God, the only God. And Paul is saying, look, you're in Christ and Christ is in God. You have him. So now with that thinking, thinking like a believer, it says, you know what? This isn't all there is. We can go back through these five things with a different view of what it all is. The world now for the believer becomes a gateway to the next. This is not my home. I am just traveling through. I know where I'm going. I know my Savior lives. I know I will be with him. I can go through the difficulties of this life, the pain, the sorrows, but I know there will be a day where all the tears are gone. What a change. And go on and talk about this life. A life is no longer something to cling to. Yes, we should take care of our bodies. We should do what we can do. But we can anticipate there is something greater. I'll have a resurrected body. I will be like my Savior. Death, right? The last enemy. What has Jesus done to death? He's vanquished it. His resurrection foreshadows our own. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He dealt with that one, didn't he? What a powerful Savior. We as believers, as followers of Jesus, those in Christ, we can look at death even radically different than the world. Right? We can say in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know where we are going. It has no ownership over us. We know the Savior will deal with all of it. It speaks to the present, this present day, this moment right here, right now. We can apply Scripture. We can say for such a time as this, the sovereign God of the universe has placed my life. He has placed me in the family He wants me to be in. He's placed me in the work He wants me to be. He's placed me in the situations that are challenging me, that I'm struggling through. And through all of it, I can trust there's a sovereign God who's refining me. Oh, that's a wonderful thought. We may not like the refinement when it happens, but it is good because he is the potter, you are the clay, and there's a moment where the Savior of this universe, the creator of all of it, holds you in his hand, and he says, do you see this bowl I made for noble purposes? Yeah, this person, he goes to Faith Community Bible Church, this one right here, just see this one. Got a whole bunch of them here I'm working on. That's what he's doing. He's shaping and forming your life. We go through his structure, our, our pains of life, the struggles of life, and there's a sovereign God who is refining you because he's not absent. So the believer comes to this list, and Paul is saying, look, why are you creating divisions and factions in your church when all of this is yours? I have it all. And of course, this speaks to the future. Now, to fear it, belong to Christ. Christ belongs to me. I am in Christ. Christ belongs to God. I am in God. I have Him. I have all of them, not in part, but in whole. I think it's important for us, church, to say if we're going to be one that's going to be built, right, with the right materials, you know, we're going to build upon God's Word. Jesus prays in His priestly prayer, Lord, sanctify them by Your Word. Your Word is truth. By Your truth, Your Word is truth. We have to be and have conviction here that we're going to teach and hold to this. So you must be determined. You in your own life, start calling. If that's sin, call it. Repent of it. Follow after the Savior. Find accountability. If you have struggles with issues in your life, things that are bondage, things that are holding on to you, well, that's fine. Let's, let's team you up with someone who can walk with you. Be man enough and woman enough to say, right, to go, you know what, I need help. And walk with someone. I think it's very, very tragic if we view our Christianity as nothing more than finding fulfillment. And so much more. He has made you for so much more. He has placed you sovereignly 
where he wants you to be, that you would be a light that would shine. Let's put our eyes back on him. Close with this quote from Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon. My wife reads his morning and evening devotions, and she shared this with me the other day. Not knowing what I was preaching on, I thought I need to share that. He's out of his uh, the morning of, of June 28th. He says, Remember, therefore, it is not thy hold of Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not thy joy in Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that be the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merits. Therefore, look not so much to thy hand with which thou art grasping Christ as to Christ. Look not to thy hope, but to Jesus, the source of thy hope. Look not to thy faith, but to Jesus, the author and finisher of thy faith. We shall never find happiness by looking at our prayers, our doings, or our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. If we would at once overcome Satan and have peace with God, it must be by looking unto Jesus. Keep thine eyes simply on him. Let his death, his sufferings, his merits, his glories, his intercession be fresh upon thy mind. When thou wakest in the morning, look to him. When thou liest down at night, look to him. Oh, let not the hopes or fears come between thee and Jesus. Follow hard after him. And he will never fail thee. He closes this devotion with this lyric from the, the hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. My life, the world, the wisdom of the world, none of it. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean upon Jesus' name. This is the Savior we have. This is the one who has overcome the world. This is the confidence the believer has. And we must come and say, you know what? I am determined to be part of a church that would be built with, with fine materials, gold and silver. I want to be a part of that that takes being coming and submitting to the authority of God's word and saying, Lord, I want to be in the world's eyes a fool that I might be wise in yours. Let's pray. Father, we are eternally grateful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, that you would take time to come to redeem. Just thinking upon what Christ has gone through, that he would set his glory aside, being born into a poor family, suffering the miseries of this life, living under the law, fulfilling the law. And then going to the cross, and upon that cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this moment in history where the wrath was, your wrath was poured upon him. And our sins, Lord, were dealt with. Such love, Lord, you have. And we simply, Lord, this morning cling to Christ. Lord, let us become fools according to this world that we might be wise in your eyes. Let us hold near and dear Christ and Him crucified. Let that be our anthem. Let that be our foundation. Let it be, as, as Spurgeon has said, when we lay down at night and we get up in the morning, let us keep the gospel of Jesus Christ in front of us. Lord, let us be wise and aware of how the world tries to influence us different things we see and hear, the different things we partake in, we ask God for your Spirit to direct us, to guide us. Pray, Lord, that each of us be determined enough that in our own walk with you, our own personal time with you, that we would call maybe the sins that we've been harboring or the, the deception maybe we've been uh, holding on to, that we would repent of it. We'd be determined to say, I want to be 
wise unto your eyes. Lord, we know that takes a, a determination. It takes effort. We ask for the help of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. Let us cling hard unto Christ. Let us know, Lord, you love us. And this morning, Lord, we know that you have what is best. You know what is good. And we go through the difficulties of life, but we trust you are the sovereign God. You have placed us. You have a reason. And we may not know this side of eternity, but we trust you. We know that you're in control. We know that you're fully present in your omnipresence. We know that you're with us. We know that when we pray according to your purposes, you hear. So, Lord, hear our prayer. Encourage us and strengthen us. Give us the courage and, and the resolve enough to begin to call sin what it is, sin, repent of it, turn to you. Let us be determined to go this way and grow this way. And Lord, we thank you for your ongoing grace, your mercies, new every morning. Thank you, God, for loving us. Pray that we be encouraged today, not out of guilt, Lord, unless that there's something we're holding on to that needs to be confessed, but out of a right heart and motivation, Lord, we pursue you. We ask simply, God, be glorified in us. Grow your church, Lord, upon this solid foundation. Let us be a church that is determined to pursue you and you alone. And use us, Lord, for outreach into the community. Use us, Lord, to bring not just glory to your name, but to make your name known. We trust in you. We love you. We commit all this to you. We pray your blessing upon it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.